The Honour of Being Human by George Cooper. In 1959, a man was wedged in Peak Cavern Castleton for three days, triggering off the most concentrated rescue bid in British caving. The massive exercise ended in failure when he died still trapped. Anyone who was caving in Derbyshire during the 60s will recall the incident and usually remember the name Neil Moss. His death endures in the memory of cavers to this day, thanks mainly to the enormous media coverage of the rescue effort, an attempt that had a profound effect on the development of the Derbyshire Cave Rescue Organisation, and the current state of cave rescue in Derbyshire owes much to reorganisation that took place in the wake of events at Peak Cavern. At 1pm on Sunday 22nd of March 1959, a party of seven cavers, all experienced by the standards of the day, entered Peak Cavern, the well-known show cave at Castleton. John Randalls, Ken Hurst, Brian Robinson, Peter Sandall, Pete Crabtree, Bob Toogood and Oxford undergraduate Neil Moss left the end of the tourist section a few minutes later, intending to explore an extension beyond Pickering's Passage and take photographs in that area. Pickering's is a small inlet passage leading into the upper gallery. Discovered in 1956, it involves three climbs, two squeezers, copious amounts of mud and ended in a large, well-decorated chamber now known as Moss Chamber. The extension beyond had been partly descended by four of the party a fortnight previously, but they had withdrawn due to a shortage of ladder. It took the form of a shaft leading down from a fireplace-like recess in the inclined stalagmite floor of the chamber. The shaft is an elliptical slit with a maximum width of two feet, tapering on one side to almost nothing. It drops near vertically for 12 feet, after which a corkscrew twist drops another five feet to an inclined bedding tube into which one slides feet first and which closes after a further 15 feet. Just before its end, however, another elliptical slit opens in the floor of the tube, cutting back slightly in the direction from which you approach. It is about 18 inches wide in the centre, tapering to nothing at either end, and had been descended another 10 feet. It was described by one of the previous fortnight's party as tight, but not unduly so, and seemed to possess a very slight draught. By 3.15 the photographs had been taken, 75 feet of electron ladder lowered into the shaft, and Neil Moss volunteered to go down first. A philosophy student, who had held a commission in the Royal Signals Regiment during conscription, Moss was 20 years old, slimly built, and 6 feet tall. He was a fit, competent caver with two years' experience, and had joined the party as a friend of Crabtree's. He wore woolen clothing under an XWD exposure suit, a cotton boiler suit on top, and had an acetylene lamp on his helmet. No lifeline was thought necessary, as it was impossible to fall from the ladder. At 3.30pm, he entered the shaft. He climbed down the first shaft, entered the tube feet first, kicking the ladder before him, and hung it down the unexplored vertical tube. Too good then climbed down into the bedding tube, and Moss entered the vertical one. With gravity and a muddy boiler suit to help him, he had no difficulty passing a first constriction into a wider section and then through another squeeze to reach the bottom at about 20 feet. He shouted up that he was standing on a boulder blockage with about 25 feet of excess ladder at his feet and that he could see what he thought was a boulder blocking a possible continuation of the shaft. He tried to move this but only succeeded in settling it deeper and jamming the ladder. Hurst had by now joined too good in the tube above and they tried to pull it free. It came a little way and then jammed solid. At this point, Moss shouted up that he was tired and would come back up and let the others have a go. As it was impossible for two men to pass anywhere along the tube or shaft, Too Good and Hurst withdrew to the chamber and waited for him to appear. After ten minutes, he had not arrived, so they shouted down to him. He told them he was having difficulty getting his feet up from rung to rung because of the narrowness of the shaft. A few minutes more of struggling and he shouted that he couldn't climb out and asked the others to pull the ladder whilst he held on to it. Hurst went back down to the top of the final section and managed to lift Moss and the ladder a little way before it jammed solid again. 
The other five team members pulled from in the chamber, but to no avail. Hurst, by now, had had enough and went back up, noticing as he went that Moss's acetylene lamp was very dim, with just a trace of flame at the jet. A contingency plan was needed. On the way into the chamber, the party had rigged the third climb in Pickering's passage with a hand line. This rope was made of hemp and of uncertain origin. It was the only one they had with them. Randalls went to fetch it, and it was passed down to Moss, who said he was unable to tie the rope around himself as the tube was too constricted. Someone then climbed down and tied the rope to the ladder as far down the final tube as possible, in the hope that without the rung end snagging in the narrow side of the upper shaft, the ladder and Moss could be lifted. With five men pulling above and one in the tube, the rope stretched a little and then snapped. The men in the chamber went sprawling down the slope. Moss was asked again to tie the rope around himself and again insisted he could not, so the man nearest him made a loop in its end and lowered it to him. Moss was able to pass his raised arms through this and get it down around his chest. All six men started to pull. They raised him as far as the constriction, where he jammed and as the strain on the rope increased, it broke again. It was obvious that a stronger rope was required and at 5.15pm, Randalls and Toogood set off out of the cave to get help. Whilst they were gone, a further effort to pull him out was made. This time, the rope did not break, but they could not move him higher than the first constriction, five feet from the bottom of the shaft. It was during this last attempt that a further worrying development became evident. At first, Moss had remained very calm and showed no signs of panic. But after two hours in the shaft, his behaviour started to become noticeably irrational. He became less cooperative, seemed unconcerned about the seriousness of his plight, and even suggested to the others that they go out to eat. And as his mental condition deteriorated, the men in the shaft with him started to experience difficulty in breathing. Hurst, a cave diver, realised that the air was becoming polluted and came out into the chamber with a violent headache. Crabtree left for the surface, to relay this disturbing information. Meanwhile, Randalls and Toogood had met Les Salmon of the Derbyshire Cave Rescue Organisation, who was an expert on Pete Cowan. Unaware of the carbon dioxide build-up in the shaft, they had agreed that a fresh team of men and better rope will be sufficient for the rescue. By now, Moss had been in the shaft for five hours. He was unconscious and could be of no further assistance to his would-be rescuers, who were forced to retreat before being overcome by CO2. Shortly after 10pm, Salmon arrived in the chamber. The need to ventilate the shaft was obvious. Hurst and Robinson were sent out to ask for a supply of oxygen and a hose, and to call out the Derbyshire Cave rescue. The men in the chamber sat in subdued conversation, listening. Shortly before midnight, the breathing ceased for 10 seconds, and then a prolonged rattling sound. They grabbed the rope and were about to pull when the rattling stopped and the chamber throbbed again to the echo of his breath. The first oxygen arrived at 12.30am and with it Salmon went down the shaft. From the top of the final crevice Salmon could not see Moss nor get him to respond. Even with mouthfuls of oxygen from the bottle he was forced to withdraw. It was now Monday 23rd of March and outside in the night the police were having difficulty getting DCRO rescuers to the scene. Most of them had no telephones and lived in the urban areas of Derby, Nottingham, Manchester and Sheffield, and individuals were not responding to the call-out. As dawn broke outside, the remaining members of the original party and the earlier rescue teams made their way to the surface and witnessed the frenetic scene which was taking place at the entrance. As the day progressed, more and more organisations were called in. After several failed attempts to reach Moss with oxygen, it was obvious that the shaft would have to be ventilated before any further progress could be made. Component parts of an apparatus for clearing polluted atmospheres were flown up from Royal Navy Leon Solent. Soda lime canisters were brought from Nottingham. Compressed air came from Manchester. Mini rescue equipment, too large to be taken into the cave from Chesterfield. And all the while, more oxygen was quite uselessly ferried in, for the problem was not one of oxygen lack but one of carbon dioxide excess. The diagnosis and equipment came too late. 
It was now 10 p.m. on the Monday, and Moss had been stuck in the shaft for some 30 hours. His respiration was becoming extremely weak and irregular. Attempts were made to get steel hooks under his arms or to push him down, but it was impossible to move him in any way. Probably the last person to see him alive was John Larson, who described it thus. Moss was filling the shaft completely with just the top of his head and shoulders showing. His right arm was below him and pinned to his side by the rock. His left arm, bent across his chest and trapped beneath one of the ladder rungs in such a way that he would have been unable to free it. When pressure was put on the rope, the effect was to rock Moss forward into a position in which he became immovable. By Tuesday morning, outside the cave were gathered police, fire and ambulance services, RAF and naval personnel, mines rescue, civil defence, people with equipment from specialist firms, 200 or more cavers who had come in response to BBC bulletins, reporters, photographers, TV cameramen and the parents of the trapped boy. The free-for-all that ensued underlined the need for a more efficient cave rescue call-out system. By that time, Neil Moss had already been dead for perhaps as much as eight hours. The announcement came at 11.15am and Mr and Mrs Moss made it quite clear to police and rescue leaders that they wished no one to risk even the slightest injury to recover their son's body and intimated that they thought it proper for it to rest where it lay. At 3pm rescue services were withdrawn from the cave. The gates to the cavern were locked. The lights of the show section left burning and the police began to mull over the legal implications of leaving Moss's body in the shaft. Two days after Moss's death, the enormous amount of rescue equipment was cleared from the passages and laid out in the rope walks by the entrance, and Peak Cavern was closed to the public until after the inquest. This was held in Castleton on May the 6th, when Dr Charles Eccles testified that Moss was initially overcome by the build-up of CO2 in the shaft caused by lack of atmospheric circulation, the exhalations of Moss and his companions, and waste gases from acetylene lamps, and that death was due to asphyxia with hypothermia almost certainly a contributory factor. Time of death was given as 3am on Tuesday 24th of March. Dr Eccles concluded that there was no question of negligence on anyone's part, and the coroner recorded the verdict of misadventure. The role of the gentlemen of the press throughout deserves consideration. The first tip to the newspapers came at about 8pm on the Sunday, and all the Manchester printed nationals carried the story on the Monday. As the rescue effort grew, so did the media coverage, until, at the height of the operation, there were pressmen in Castleton in a one-to-two ratio with rescuers. Some newspapers attempted to contrive events towards their own ends. The Daily Express found and brought to Castleton a heroine, the 18-year-old June Bailey, and many other newspapers carried ambiguous accounts of her exploits. It seems that the undoubtedly well-intentioned Miss Bailey did reach the chamber, but no record exists of a serious attempt by her to reach Moss. She attained sufficient celebrity, however, for a leading women's magazine to carry a feature about her, even a year after the events. Unwilling to be outdone, the Manchester Evening News rushed an ex-circus acrobat to Castleton in the closing stages of the rescue attempt. Apparently, he could be suspended for long periods by his feet, but unfortunately, a yard-high wall of mud and water was sweeping through the cave as he arrived, according to the evening news, and his services were not, therefore, required. Two newspapers in particular balanced out some of this debt. The Daily Mirror contributed money and publicity to the Neil Moss Fund, originally intended to reimburse individual rescuers, but eventually going to cave rescue organisations and the Manchester Guardian was exemplary in its reportage and editorial comment. Their leader of the 25th of March, probably written by Patrick Monkhouse, is worth reproducing. The death of a young man in the depths of a pothole in Derbyshire is moving both by its isolation and for the evidence of human community displayed in the attempts at rescue that went before it. Of the 300 and more people, policemen, doctors, voluntary rescue workers who showed such skill and heroism in the efforts to save the life of a fellow human being, it can be said that their devotion brought light into the darkness of the caves. It was not their fault that they did not succeed, and it may be that their very failure 
will help to save other lives. For the young man who died in Peak Cavern, there must be mourning, but there can be a sense of pride in him too. Those who risk danger, whether in caves, on mountains or at sea, must sometimes have to pay the full price they have pledged. It could not be otherwise. The adventurers cannot guard against all risks without reducing adventure to make believe. The death that came in the darkness at Peak Cavern is pitiful, but it is good that there are those for whom youth or adventure or a cause are willing to risk such an end. It is in this that the honour of being human exists. The Moss Affair made its last major appearance in August 1959 when awards to the rescuers were announced. Now, more than 60 years on, the grave is still there in Moss Chamber. Most of the mud has now been washed from its floor and though many of the former decorations no longer exist, the calcite walls gleam with a memory of their former beauty and time to repair the damage drips on.